Welcome to the Aspen Institute's McCloskey Speaker Series event featuring Ross Dowfit in conversation with Michelle Goldberg. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs and Engagement here at the Aspen Institute. And I first want to thank Bonnie and Tom McCloskey for making this series possible. Thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. As I introduce our guests today, you'll see uh, links to their bios in the chat. And throughout the event, uh, you'll also find information um, in the chat. If you have questions of Ross that you'd like to pose, please type those into the Q&A feature throughout the event. Uh, we're so looking forward to hearing from Ross today about his new book, The Decadent Society, how we became the victims of our own success. Uh, the book was released on February 25th of this year, and there's a link to purchase the book in the chat. Ross writes an op-ed column for the New York Times every Tuesday and Sunday. He co-hosts the Times op-ed podcast, um, The Argument, and he was a senior editor at The Atlantic and has authored several books. We're thrilled to have Ross with us today. Our moderator is Michelle Goldberg, also an op-ed columnist for The New York Times. She was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize in 2018 for reporting on workplace sexual harassment issues. She is also an award-winning author and co-host with Ross of the New York Times podcast, The Argument. We're thrilled and honored to feature you both today. Um, so with that, over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Hey, so thanks for having me. Um, a funny story about this book is that, or the rollout of this book, we were supposed to have, we were supposed to talk about this book on the live version of our podcast, which I believe the last one was in March. I remember saying that maybe I had a cough, it wasn't COVID. I was a little bit worried about what would happen if I showed up to this thing and was coughing on stage and people would panic. And that was, you know, I guess the last time people in New York City left their house. So I'm glad that we have a chance to talk about it now. So I guess let me start, I mean, I know the answer to this question, but let, Ross, why don't you start by talking about what you mean by, by decadent? Because it's not like, orgies and opium dens and your version sadly. of decadence. <laughs> yeah, sad, sadly, <laughs> right. sadly, Otherwise, no. this would be a very different book. And so this is a version of decadence that actually has sterility as a really important component of it. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, Michelle, thank you thank you for doing this it's it's really nice to be to be with you virtually um and it's true that was actually one of the last two book events that i did on my tour and it had the last couple events had this sort of apocalyptic feel where you know you weren't you weren't sure if you should be there half the audience wasn't sure if they should is it be really there. worth dying for was this it book? really worth dying for this book but i'm here to tell you this book is worth it's to die for um but anyway no to so to answer your to answer to your question, decadence in my definition, um, which I'm stealing in part from people smarter than me, is basically a period of stagnation, drift, repetition, and sterility at a high level of sort of wealth and technological development. And the argument in the book is that this kind of decadence, this sense of sort of repetition and futility has kind of defined the Western world, Europe, and especially the United States ever since the late 1960s and early 1970s. And that a lot of our sort of political derangements and cultural anxieties and uncertainties reflect this sense of disappointment that the future turned out to be not as dynamic and dramatic as we expected it to be. And so, you know, you've had a period of economic slowdown and deceleration relative to the post-war period. Um, you've had a period of demographic decline, which uh, you've, you know, this is something that we've both written about, but um, we've ended up with a rich world where every country has below replacement birth rates. Uh, no country is replacing itself. That feeds back into economic stagnation. We've had a period of increasing political gridlock and sclerosis, which I think is the least controversial part of my thesis. Everybody can see that at work in Washington, D.C. 
Um, and then a little more controversially, I argue that in fact, technology has been sort of disappointing that um, we've had huge breakthroughs in communications technology, which is why we can still do a book event like this in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but in energy and transportation and the built environment, um, certainly in space travel, relative to what people expected 50 or 60 years ago, um, we haven't we haven't had the breakthroughs that people that people imagine. So it's all iPhones and no flying cars, I guess you could say. Um, so that's that's the basic argument in the in the first half of the book that this is sort of where we are as a society, not hurtling towards either utopia or disaster, but in certain ways more stuck than we expected to be. Okay, but well, speaking of hurtling towards disaster, um, <laughs> yes. So. You know, obviously things have changed a lot since this book came out. So I'm gonna, you know, I, I mean, I don't think our sense of profound disappointment has changed, or at least not mine, but um, I'm just gonna read from page 178, um, where you're talking about the risks of anti-decadence, right? Or kind of the, maybe the consolations of decadence. Um, a feature of societies where the male, um, okay, that do starts with the reality that complaining about decadence is almost by definition a luxury good, a feature of societies where the mail is delivered, the trains and planes are running on time, the crime rate is relatively low, and there are plenty of entertainments at your fingertips. Um, so none of that's really true anymore. And I guess what has your feelings about are we still in a decadent moment or have we moved into a more apocalyptic moment? I mean, we're in a moment of, we're obviously in a moment of crisis. Um, and the question is, is that crisis um, just sort of exposing, you know, exposing our decadence more profoundly than normalcy did? Or is it some opening into a period of greater transformation or greater catastrophe, right? And mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the boring answer is that it's too <laughs> soon to tell. Uh, but I, I mean, I think certainly, you know, I spend the part of the middle part of the book, as, as you say, talking about why decadence can actually go on longer than people sometimes think, right? All the ways that it turns out to be sustainable. But of course, some of the things that make it sustainable, like, you know, enter virtual entertainments at your fingertips, um, sort of institutions that keep functioning, even if they don't function very well, a lot of those things have either have gone away, you know, Netflix hasn't gone away, but in another six months, we're gonna start to run out of Netflix shows. And you can see, I think, in our society right now, what happens when a decadent, when some of the automatic stabilizers of a decadent society stop being there. And what's exposed is obviously sort of political incompetence, um, also sort of, you know, elements of social disarray, sort of long simmering problems like police brutality suddenly become bigger issues because people have, in certain ways, more time on their hands to act, to protest, um, and also, you know, f fewer reasons to just sort of go on every day with the status quo. So it, what that means is that in certain ways, a moment like this is kind of an opportunity, right? Like I spend, a, I spend part of the book talking about how, you know, in the age of the internet, sort of protest politics has actually declined, right? And that sort of lots of effective political movements don't exist anymore because people are just liking posts on Facebook or Twitter instead. And obviously we do suddenly have a political movement that's actually in the streets, right? And we, we do have sort of a revolutionary feeling in the air. And you also have people sort of, I think, looking harder at all of the defects in our sort of sclerotic systems, all the reasons why the CDC and the FDA and, you know, local and national governments can't seem to get their act together to deal with the pandemic. And you have people sort of imagining reforms in ways that weren't necessarily being imagined before this came along. So if you wanted an optimistic vision in the midst of all of this, you know, human suffering and incredible, um, incredible challenges to the developed world, you would say that, you know, this is a moment that, that sort of throws our decadence into relief, but also offers reasons to think anew about how we might get out of it. Um, but then you could also be pessimistic and say, if you look at decadent societies, right, like if you look at, say, the Roman Empire in the last three centuries of its existence, crises like this one come along. The Roman Empire had lots of pandemics and often they come along and they, you know, 
they create a crisis, the crisis passes, and then sort of decadence intensifies, right? And that's, I think, also a possibility for the future. Well, right. I mean, a, a kind of a long running argument that you and I have on our podcast is sort of about whether we are recapitulating, um, you know, kind of these genuinely dangerous moments from the 20th century, right? Whether we are seeing the rise of real fascism, kind of genuine authoritarianism and maybe a genuine socialist alternative or whether everybody's just sort of cosplaying, right? Whether this is all just a kind of- Reen pale, A reenactment. Pale, right, a, a right. reenactment or like a pale simulacrum of these earlier moments of really intense engagement. And yeah, just seeing people out on the street, you know, just seeing p police stations burning to the ground, change your views about, um, you know, about the, the re about the material reality of the crisis that we're in. I mean, I think it, it, it makes me think that, as I said, if you remove a bunch of stabilizers, it's possible to move pretty more quickly back into history than maybe some of my views on decadence as sustainability, right, made me mm -hmm. think, right? So, I mean, it also, though, at, at the same time, to, to go back to the quote you started with, it also, in certain ways, sharpens the case for decadence, right? That, you know, one of the things about living through a pandemic like this is you realize, you know, there really are worse things than sort of a slightly boring, repetitive stability. Um, and one of them is having hundreds of thousands of Americans die of a deadly disease while the government seems incompetent to handle it. Um, but I mean, I guess, you know, I guess I haven't, I, I haven't completely given up on my skepticism about sort of the the actual effects of protest politics and radical politics in this moment, right? That I think it's totally possible that in 10 years, we'll look back on even these protests and say, well, it was basically the 50th anniversary of 1968. And so we had a kind of wild reenactment of that moment, but then it ended with, you know, maybe a few cosmetic reforms to policing, um, and, you know, some, some, you know, sort of ex accentuation of certain tensions in urban, in urban areas and further consolidation of a lot of powerful entities in Silicon Valley and the media, and then decadence sort of intensified again. So I'm, I, I think that is, you know, I, I think that's still a pretty live scenario for the world once the pandemic goes away. So when I, when I read your book, there's some degree of overlap between the idea of decadence and just kind of the liberal order, you know, and when you talk about emerging, what, what might emerge from decadence, it's often in this book, a version of post-liberalism. And so I guess, how do you separate out what is that, what is just technocratic liberalism um, and what is, what is decadence? Like, is there a version of, you know, technocratic liberalism, globalization, um, you know, a Scandinavian welfare state that is not the decadent society? I mean, I think, I think there is, if that society has some kind of sense of frontier or mission um, that it, that it sort of carries with it, right? So I start the book by talking about the space program and mm -hmm. the book maybe has a slightly weird obsession with with space, right? It begins and ends with the Apollo program. Um, but I, I actually think that the the sort of closing of the human frontier that our sort of foray into space represented where, you know, we had this period where we thought we were entering a space age and we had all of these science fiction stories that were imagining humanity as a multi-planetary species within a couple of hundred years. The fact that all of that pretty quickly went away and we decided, you know, for understandable reasons that space was sort of too big and too vast to really go anywhere, has sort of thrown us back on technocracy just for stability's sake, right? So like the Apollo program is sort of technocracy in the sense that it's a bunch of smart nerds sitting around trying to figure out how to send a bunch of smart jocks into space, right? Like that's, that's technocracy in its own way, but it's technocracy that has a, I think, clearly defined sense of sort of expansive purpose and ambition. Um, 
and the, and this doesn't apply to just to sort of technological projects, right? Like there's also the question of of moral ambition. I think it's very clear that you know America in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was a technocratic society that generated profound sort of morally intense movements, the civil rights movement above all, that sort of created conditions for dramatic reform. And we still have, you know, strong moralisms kicking around our politics on both the left and right. But I think they struggle to get the kind of purchase and achieve the kind of results that, um, that moral reformers have historically been able to gain in American society. Um, and I, th I think that this but, is sort but, of- But partly that's because you oppose a lot of those movements, right? I mean, when you're like, it seems, how do you kind of reconcile the idea that, you know, the fact that, move, that various movements for moral reform, um, how, how should I put this? How do you reconcile this kind of disappointment in the, the fact that various movements for, for moral reform kind of haven't transformed society as much as they might have or as much as they have in the past with the fact that you as a conservative often oppose the transformation of society uh, in accordance Yeah, well, this is, no, I mean, this is the interesting tension in the book, right? It's a, mm -hmm. I, I am some kind of political conservative, but it's a book that's partially nostalgic for the greater dynamism of an era when liberal social movements were, were transforming the country. And I don't have a perfect resolution to that tension. I mean, I think one, one thing that I think is that certain aspects of baby boomer era liberalism were sort of, were too successful in their um, sort of, in the extent to which they overthrew past establishments. And the baby boomers had trouble figuring out what to build in their place. Um, and you lost this sort of fruitful tension between reform and tradition. You sort of pushed tradition away and then you were left to sort of float uncertainly in, in the new world that you built. So that's sort, of, that's sort of a conservative perspective. But then, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, first of all, there are a couple crusades for moral reform that right now are considered right-wing crusades, but that are crusades, right? So, you know, we, we've obviously had, had our our own podcast disagreements about abortion, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, the pro-life movement, even if you think it's wrong, is in certain ways a sort of utopian movement in a sense, yeah. right? It's, it's, a, it's a movement with a particular moral vision that it wants to promote for society. And the pro-life movement has, I think, you know, in certain ways failed to gain the kind of traction that most pro-lifers would like to see. And I think you could cite other examples. Um, I, I mean, I think there are, there are moral reform movements that, you know, that sort of blur partisan boundaries. Um, you know, I think that the, you know, the alliance, the temporary alliance between feminists and social conservatives around pornography in the 1980s was a, a cause of moral reform that has sort of floated up occasionally in our society, but mostly we've just become sort of more sort of addicted to internet pornography and that crusade has gone away. And then there are crusades on the left that um, I don't always agree with their sort of strategic vision, but I think, you know, I, I think it's, I think that there are, there are virtues in them. I was, as you know, somewhat sympathetic to elements of Bernie Sanders campaign. I think they're, you know, I'm, I'm not a socialist, but I think, certain socialist critiques of how wealth is distributed in our society have a lot of power. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, com I'm not averse to all moral reform movements. I don't, and, but, and then there are also case studies like the environmental movement, right? Where, you know, there's a version of, of a sort of climate change anxiety that you could imagine feeding into something like the Apollo program or the Manhattan project or something, some sort of sweeping, program of technological innovation that that sort of tackles climate change directly um, and sees it as a challenge to be overcome and sort of an opportunity for greater progress. And I think environmentalism- Well, isn't you know, that the Green New Deal? Well, this is, but I, I think there are elements of the Green New Deal that are way better than the kind of environmentalism that say Greta Thunberg represents where the idea is basically that if we all just start eating more oatmeal and having fewer kids, we can, I am caricaturing here, obviously, mm -hmm. but I think there is that sort of degrowth side of environmentalism that seems more like decadence. And this, I think this is a failure in part on the right, right? I think that sort of free market conservatives should look at something like the Green New Deal and say, you know, well, we can find some things to like there and we can create 
partnerships to sort of, you know, invest and innovate our way out of the challenge. So I think, I think decadence certainly applies to where the right has ended up and not just to where the left has ended up. But I think generally there's a sense of, you know, a sense that our challenges are sort of beyond our capacities to handle. And the best that we can hope for is to sort of maintain stability and hope that they don't get too bad. So the one place where there is a sense of, um, a sense that people are kind of transforming the world, transforming the frontiers of human possibility is Silicon Valley, right? But a lot of the ways in which they are transforming human possibility, you know, CRISPR babies and, um, you know, kind of these like, what, what's the word, technohumanism? Um, you know, transhumanism. Pre transhumanism, right? So that stuff, um, how do you think about that stuff, as, particularly as a Catholic? I mean, again, I would think that, you know, once again, a lot, there are, the world is transforming and kind of human possibilities are being um, expanded and limits breached, but often in ways that are kind of that, that, that contravene, you know, your deepest moral convictions. So, like, right. So, 15 years ago, um, if we had had this, if we'd had this kind of conversation, I would have said, yeah, look, I'm a social conservative and I'm deeply worried about the moral cost of accelerating technological progress. And I'm expecting to spend the next 50 years arguing about the morality of cloning and Gattaca style genetic engineering and sort of resisting certain, you know, some elements of technological change. And I think this is somewhere where my, my views have changed because those things haven't actually come along, right? Like we, you know, I mean, the human, the, the human genome project, we're now at, you know, the 20th or 21st anniversary. And obviously there's been a lot of impressive research and, you know, there are things happening in laboratories that are amazing, but you aren't getting anything like the kind of Gattaca scenarios. And meanwhile, life expectancy in the U.S. is slumping downward because we're all, people are, people are addicted to opioids, right? You aren't, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that the transhumanist future is the main thing that we should worry about when Silicon Valley can't even figure out how to do the self-driving cars that they've been working on for 10 years. So my view right now is that I might rather live in a world where certain moral and certain technological innovations are, you know, leading to big new moral debates than live in a world where we're all just, where the big innovation is just the virtual reality of the internet and everyone's just sort of living inside it and, you know, writing fewer novels, having fewer kids, having less sex. I mean, this is, I, I think decadence is sort of a weird punishment for social and cultural conservatives, right? That like 30 years ago, we would have sat around and said, you know, oh man, um, society's going down the drain and, you know, the, the, the technological innovation is going to be growing babies in vats and, um, you know, it's going to be sort of promiscuity and, and social chaos everywhere you look. And instead, God came along and said, well, actually, the future we're going to get is one where the good news is, you know, people will have fewer, there'll be fewer teen pregnancies and teenagers will have less sex, but that's because they'll all be on their computers looking at pornography. And, you know, we won't have the designer babies that you're worried about because Silicon Valley will just, you know, create apps for better food delivery <laughs> service so that, so that, you know, you can, you can get your takeout before you fire up your Netflix and, and so on. So, you know, I mean, again, there are worse things than decadence and there are, there are scenarios that I, as a Catholic, there are imaginable futures that I, as a Catholic, would be terrified to live in. But the world we live in now seems to be just sort of sliding towards a kind of wally, you know, sort of people hooked up to virtual reality um, and, um, you know, sort of amusing themselves to death kind of future. And I think I'd rather live in a more dynamic and innovative world. So does that just mean that you are becoming slowly more nostalgic for liberalism? I mean, you've written a column, you wrote a column recently about sort of apprehension about what post-liberalism on the left looks like. Um, post-liberalism on the right isn't doing so hot, right? I mean, if there's, you have kind of these post-liberal right-wing governments all over the world that are 
the most um, that that have kind of in their rejection of expertise, in their rejection of technocratic governance, have basically created mass death and apocalyptic misery when faced with the pandemic. Um, so have you at all rethought whether, you know, technocratic liberalism might be, um, you know, something more, something more to be cherished than, than you thought five or 10 years ago? Yes, probably. Or may, I mean, more in the last few months than in the last <laughs> than in the last five years, right? But I mean, I think I think the problem is that technocratic liberalism, the fact that it sort of ended in this decadent place, is why you have these post liberalisms on the right and left, right? That like there is sort of there is I think a understandable discontent with where Western societies have ended up that manifests itself in people voting for Donald Trump and, you know, people trying to cancel, you know, hypothetically New York Times columnists who, you know, who, who, um, who don't tow a certain left-wing line. And I, I think I've tried, I think I, I understand where those discontents are coming from. And so it's simultaneously, I don't want to be governed by Bolsonaro. I don't want to be governed right now by Donald Trump. Um, I don't want to be governed by the leftward flank of my Twitter feed. But I also think you have to recognize that, you know, the reason those forces exist is that the alternative of just sort of stewarding a not very innovative, low birth rate society as it slowly ages is, you know, it's, it's going to make people discontented, right? And, and so, the ideal politics, I think, is one where those movements on the left and right find a way to, you know, instead of replacing liberalism with, you know, fascism or the gulag, they find a way to sort of infuse liberalism with dynamism once again, that sort of in the encounter with right-wing populism and, um, you know, sort of woke culture or socialism, liberalism sort of recovers its own its own sort of sense of mission and purpose. That's that's sort of the optimistic view. And I, I think if you look back at, you know, the post-war period that I am nostalgic for, right? Like the book is nostalgic for the period from 1945 to 1970. Like that's mm -hmm. just flatly the case. Um, that is a period when liberalism was on the one hand sort of locked in a sort of combat with communism that sort of forced it to address itself to left-wing protest movements and left-wing desires in a particular way. Liberalism, though, was also at that point still infused more than it is now with my own religion, with Christianity, right? Like post-war American liberalism was much more religious than American liberalism is today. And so to the extent that I'm, I'm imagining anything for the future optimistically, it, it's something like that. I would like to see sort of a religious revival on the right and a sort of healthy socialism on the left and for liberalism to be improved by its encounter with both of those forces. Doesn't mean we're going to get it, but that's, that's, I think, where, where, what I'm thinking right now. Sorry, baby. Hey. <laughs> um, so the, the period that you're talking about is also a high watermark of economic equality in this country. Right. And I think, I mean, I think kind of a left wing person looking at the same set of, you know, facts and anecdotes that you collect in this book would say that the decadent society is a society of, you know, extreme inequality. On the one hand, you know, very rich people with so much money that they kind of invested in all sorts of or wasted in all sorts of, um, you know, trivialities and indulgences. And then everybody else um, kind of locked into these increasingly hysterical ideological battles because they are in such a situation of precarity and scarcity. So tell me why decadence is about, you know, low birth rates and a crisis of faith and not just about what, you know, what a left wing person will call neoliberalism. Well, I mean, so part of the issue is that neoliberalism itself was kind of the solution to, or it was cast as the solution to the initial wave of decadence, right? So that post-war society, 
the, ran into trouble in the 1970s because it was having trouble generating further growth, right? And so the neoliberal solution was, well, look, you've got really high tax rates and really high levels of regulation. And if we reduce the tax burden and deregulate somewhat, you can get, you can get more growth, get some growth back. And that worked up to a point, and then it too sort of ran out of gas somewhere between the late 1990s and, and the financial crisis. And I think the challenge is that, you know, the sort of strict left perspective would say, well, you just need to do, you know, you just need to do more redistribution, right? So neoliberalism went too far, and you need just higher taxes on the rich and more spending on the poor. And that would get you back to higher levels of levels of equality, but it would get you back to, to a somewhat more equal society. The societies of Western Europe are somewhat more equal than the US and they are somewhat more socialist in certain ways, but they aren't actually more economically dynamic, right? Like France is not the economic powerhouse of Europe. And it really is the case that the sort of more neoliberal US has sort of carried the developed world in terms of its growth rates and productivity growth for the last 20 years or so. So I think it's both the case that neoliberalism sort of ran out of gas, but also that, you know, what strict socialism offers is the promise of equality, but not necessarily the promise of greater dynamism. And if you want to get out of decadence, you need to sort of have both. So I think, you know, the, the ideas that sort of people on the more interesting part of the right float nowadays about, you know, sort of industrial policy and technological investment and so on. Those seem a little more attractive to me than just saying, well, we need to just spend more money on Medicaid because they hold out the hope that you could get greater equality through, you know, through essentially investments that create more jobs for the working class, but also create more positive externalities for society as a whole. And it's also the case that, you know, I think inequality can be a sign of decadence, but inequality isn't, sorry, inequality can be a sign of decadence, but it also does sometimes, it is sometimes associated with good times coming back, right? So the 19, late 1990s were the best period for working in middle-class America out of the last 30 years. They were also a brief period when inequality went up because you had a lot of early internet era big fortunes being made. And that's, that's not a bad thing per se. So I, I guess I think, yes, the left is right to see the inequality we have as connected to stagnation and disappointment and the fact that our rich people and rich companies can't find anything to invest in except, you know, bad ideas like or fake companies like Theranos and luxury goods. That's a really bad sign. But you need something more than just redistribution to get you out of the, the sort of trough we're stuck in. Okay, so the other thing that marks this period that you kind of look back on so fondly is obviously the Cold War and great power competition and, right, you know, the sense of ideological crusade. And I remember right after 9-11, you know, people were shocked and horrified, but there was also among a significant group of intellectuals, maybe not just intellectuals, this real sense of exhilaration, right? That history had started yep. again, that the time for big ideas and, you know, sort of world bestriding um, activity had returned. And that was really bad. Um, is there, that was, that <laughs> was incorrect, yes. Is, so I guess, is there a version of, you know, non-decadence or emerging from decadence that doesn't involve, um, the rebirth of imperialism. Well, I mean, again, this is the attraction of space, right? Is that as far as we know, most of space is empty of alien life forms. And so like, a, you know, if Mars were actually habitable for humans, then you could get the, you know, temporarily until the Mars Earth Wars <laughs> start up, you can actually get certain patterns of exploration and dynamism without running into sort of the moral dilemmas um, and, you know, moral crimes of imperialism. So that's, that's the space issue. I think the great power thing, though, is, um, I mean, I, I think it's definitely the case that societies tend to be most innovative and dynamic in the context of live sort of great power and ideological conflicts, right? And that, you know, it really is the case that, 
um, you know, the history of Western Europe generally long before the Cold War, I think is suggestive of that, that you have a continent with a lot of different small powers trying to be big powers and they're in competition with each other and it helps drive the scientific revolution, it helps drive the enlightenment, it helps drive all kinds of things that are morally ambiguous, but do produce the kind of dynamism that created the civilization we have now. Um, and so in, in that sense, you know, if there were an ideological rival to the US that was as powerful as the Soviet Union seemed to be, there would be positive effects from that kind of conflict, even as there would be negative effects as well. I think the danger is that you can't, you can't just invent that, right? The lesson of the post 9-11 era is that you can't just say, all right, we're gonna declare that Islamofascism <laughs> is our big civilizational rival. And this is gonna give us the sense of mission because Islamofascism wasn't really a real thing. And to the extent it was a real thing, you just, you know, it wasn't a real rival to the US. And in trying to make it one, we just ended up in a huge quagmire in the Middle East. And, and I think the question with China right now is whether, I think there's a case to be made that China is sort of emerging as a, not just a geopolitical rival, but a genuine civilizational alternative as it becomes more totalitarian as it sort of exploits information technology to surveil um, its own its own people in profound ways. And that's a really bad thing for the people of China, but it, it does offer an opportunity for Americans who are currently at each other's throats to sort of rediscover some of the virtues of a liberal society, right? To say, well, we whatever we want our future to be like, we don't want it to be like, you know, social credit systems and surveillance cameras everywhere you look. But it might also be, and this is an argument as you know, I make in the book, it might also be that China is, what we're seeing right now is not China sort of entering into all of its power, but actually China sort of peaking. And because the Chinese have their own demographic problems, their own sort of possibly economically stagnant future, what they're doing right now during the pandemic, you know, saber rattling against Taiwan, sort of consolidating power in Hong Kong, fighting skirmishes with India, all of that is them sort of trying to claim as much power as they can before they become decadent themselves. In which case, being a China hawk runs into some of the same problems as being an Iraq war hawk did 20 years ago, where you're insisting that this is your grand civilizational rival, um, but really it's not. But, but we'll know is, more in 10 years. But there is an obvious, um, I mean, part, there is an obvious sort of, um, potential great power ideological rivalry, which is, you know, the, the, the fight against populist authoritarianism, um, the fight for kind of liberal pluralism and cosmopolitanism against populist authoritarianism. Um, that's something that, um, you know, would obviously excite a lot of people in Western Europe. It would excite, um, at least certain people in the United States, if not, you know, and, not and, all, and, right. right, but that's a place where there are sort of obvious, um, obvious lines to be drawn, right? You have, you know, just as you had in the 1930s, when you had the rise of fascism and the rise of fascism sort of predicated on the idea that liberalism has, had failed, that it had exhausted itself, that parliamentary democracy didn't work and that these were more sort of dynamic and effective systems of government. Right, you could at least imagine liberal democracy bestirring itself to fight populist authoritarianism. Except if it did, um, like which side would you be on? So, um, I mean, I would not be on the side of uh, you know Erdogan and Vladimir Putin in a in a sort of clash of civilizations. Right, but but the, Hungary, liberal West, Hungary, Poland. But, well, but here, but here's the thing, right? And this is this is sort of you know coming to to the heart of one of our ongoing disagreements. But to me, like China represents an authoritarianism that is seems potentially a potentially powerful rival to the U.S. As I said, I'm not sure that it can sustain itself that way, but it it could be. I look at populist authoritarianism, and I just see, for the most part incompetence and and folly and countries that are fundamentally weak 
like Russia punching above their weight because Putin is a pretty good Machiavellian game games player. Um, so I think it's totally reasonable for a sort of liberal center to try and rally itself against, you know, against what Donald Trump represents, against what Vladimir Putin represents. Um, but you run into a liberal version of the kind of threat inflation that you got from conservatives after 9-11, right? Where fundamentally, Russia is not America's number one geopolitical foe. It is not poised, you know, there, there were a bunch of pieces written after Putin, um, after Putin annexed Crimea about all his territorial ambitions in the Balkans and in Poland. And that just seems to me to totally overestimate the Russian threat. Like Russia can barely sustain a guerrilla war, guerrilla war in Eastern Ukraine in its for, you know, a territory that was ruled by Russia for hundreds of years. Um, and it can, you know, it can, it can hack American politicians and wreak havoc right. in and, democracy. Right, and the United States is on its knees, partly because of something that Putin helped do. I mean, yes, but it's like, I mean, the U.S. after 9-11 was, you know, was sort of brought to a moment of, of maximal crisis and terror by something that a, a terrorist mastermind in a cave did. But it didn't mean that the terrorist mastermind was actually sort of someone who you could well, organize you really your politics this, around. Can you really compare this moment when like we can't even send our kids to school and you know cities are under curfews and you know you kind of have to worry about you know whether you can shop in the you know whether whether supermarkets are going to be stocked um to say nothing of you know the the, widespread immiseration that's about to begin when expanded ui runs out can you i mean after 9-11 people were scared but the 9-11 really was not that much of a blow to the united states compared to where we are right now no i mean i, I mean i agree although it's sort of I don't know. I, I, it's a little hard to figure where we are right now. Part of the strange thing about the moment is that we have spent all this money to sort of float the stock market up and maintain people on UI. And I mean, we'll, we'll see what spending happens. But no, I mean, this moment is, you know, in terms of lives lost and chaos, it's worse than 9-11. Worse than but what's happened is the fruit of total incompetence, <laughs> right? Rather than like Donald Trump is not consolidating authoritarian power in the US right now. He's like yelling at people to go back to school, right? Like, and, you know, and conducting Twitter wars with, with Joe Scarborough. Um, and it, it doesn't mean, I mean, I, I guess I just think that a, a liberalism that, a liberalism that opposes Donald Trump makes all the sense in the world, but a liberalism that assumes that populism represents right now this sort of alternative to liberalism that you can sort of organize yourself around and against. I don't know. I mean, there are populist leaders. Um, you know, you mentioned Hungary, right? Like Viktor Orban is an actually really effective politician, but he's running Hungary, um, meaning no disrespect to the Hungarians listening to this event, right? But, you know, he's, he's running Hungary and He's not sort of, he's not leading a, you know, a grand alliance of reactionary powers at the moment. So it just, I, I mean, again, it just seems to me that you sh liberals should be able to oppose populism without assuming that it represents something as coherent and dangerous as either the Soviet Union did or as the fascist powers did in the 1930s. Okay, well... One of our long running arguments is about the degree to which Donald Trump actually has consolidated power, but rather than pursue that, I'm supposed to turn it over to <laughs> they should tune into the podcast. <laughs> I'm going to turn that over. I'm supposed to turn it over to Q&A. Great. This is uh, such a fascinating discussion. Thank you both so much. Uh, we have a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, the first one is, do you think the Trump presidency has increased the move toward a decadent society? So I would have said absolutely yes before the pandemic. I mean, I think what's, what's fascinating about Trump is that he is both a manifestation of decadence, but also a professed rebel against it, right? That like the whole make America great again sort of thing is based on sort of nostalgia for a future that didn't arrive, right? It's a very much a sort of like, we were promised a better future than this, 
Um, I'm going to bring it to pass. We've been led by, you know, fools and morons for 30 or 40 years. And if you go back and rewatch Trump's, you know, his, his last big speech before the pandemic hit, right, his State of the Union, where he was basically kicking off his reelection campaign, it was basically a speech that said, we were decadent and I beat it, <laughs> right? That was like the theme of the State of the Union. Now, in reality, he didn't beat it. Um, we just had slightly better than late Obama economic growth. Um, and so much of the Trump administration was this sort of, this just sort of shift of politics even deeper into the sort of purely performative where everything is just happening, you know, on cable news and on Twitter, no legislation is passing. Um, and, you know, and you have sort of these, you know, people acting online, like we're in the midst of this grand ideological battle, even as the country sort of proceeds more or less as it was. So that's that's sort of the argument that he just sort of led us deeper into decadence. Now, the fact that, as Michelle and I were just talking about, his incompetence has sort of exacerbated the chaos associated with the pandemic means that, you know, you could imagine a world where we look back and say, well, by electing this, you know, totally incompetent rebel against decadence, we ended up with a crisis out of which emerged genuine transformation, in which case, then no, then Trump is a doorway into a different world, not just a deepening of decadence. Um, but I'm, I'm still skeptical that that is what's going to happen. And in terms of sort of his capacities and what he represents as an institutional figure, I think he's obviously a, a decadent figure himself. And he does get you closer to the classic definition of decadence too, right? The guy with several wives and gold-plated bedchambers and so on. That's 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 the uh, more the opium den style of decadence, but he doesn't smoke opium. I think. <laughs> Our next question is: How much do you think the current atmosphere of extreme partisan partisanship exacerbates our stagnation? Um, I mean, it clearly a great deal in the sense that it prevents political, it prevents political change, right? It prevents policy reform. It prevents either right or left from enacting any kind of governing agenda. Um, so it's just sort of normal now that a president comes in and, you know, if he has control of Congress for his party, he can pass one big piece of legislation and then there'll be backlash and then we'll sort of enter, um, enter governance by executive order in the Supreme Court, which is basically how our republic works now under, under decadence, right? The American system really just has two branches of government now. Congress sort of passes a budget and then the courts and the president sort of fight it out, whether it's immigration policy or culture war battles or, you know, I mean, Obamacare is going to be sort of manipulated by executive orders and court cases for the next 20 years, probably pending pending some other reform passing. Um, so, so yes, it obviously, it obviously deepens things. I, I think the, the harder to answer question is, you know, where does it come from, right? Like why, you know, is, is there sort of a feedback loop where gridlock in Washington leads people to think of politics more in terms of like, you know, just sort of team sports which then deepens gridlock, which leads people to think of partisanship more like team sports, right? And you end up with a politics that's like the, you know, the, the political rivalries in Constantinople where it didn't matter what you thought, it was just which color chariot team you, you supported, right? So there's, there's some force at work where under decadence, you get this sort of politics as entertainment thing that, you know, both feeds gridlock and feeds off it. And it's hard to tell where the starting point is. Mm -hmm. Our next question is, you talk about a low replacement birth rate leads to economic st stagnation, but so much of what goes back to economic inequality, many people aren't having more kids because they can't afford it. How do you suggest we address this? Well, so again, I think this is one of these, it's a feedback loop, right? Where you get, and, and it's hard to say it's, you know, liter literally the chicken and the egg problem, right? So you have an economic slowdown, people have fewer kids, um, 
and then economic growth slows further because society ages and the younger generation has to pay more to sort of sustain the older generation. There's less room for innovation and then people have fewer kids, right? It's sort of a low fertility trap. And the challenge is, and this goes back in certain ways to what Michelle and I were talking about with the US versus Western Europe, the challenge is that just redistributing money doesn't seem to fix it, right? So I'm, I'm a big fan of family benefits of all kinds. Um, the book that I co-wrote like 13 years ago about how conservatism could fix itself, spent a lot of time talking about the idea that Republicans should support child tax credits and you know benefits for parents who raise kids. All of the, with the idea being always that you're trying to build more of an economic foundation beneath people who want to have, who want to start a family. And I still, and I support all of that. But if you look at Scandinavia, right, if you look at countries in Northern Europe that have all of those programs or have versions of those programs, um, many of them are dealing with exactly the same birth rate issues as, Not exactly as the, the same. US. Well, Finland is now worse than we are. Like Finland has totally cratered. Like Sweden, Sweden has maintained, um, Sweden has maintained a slightly higher fertility rate than we have, but other parts of Scandinavia did for a little while and then have declined again. Germany has one of Europe's lowest birth rates. Um, so it's just not, it can't just be that once you, you know, give people better maternity leave and more benefits that they'll have more kids. There does seem to be some, and here I'll put on my cultural conservative hat, there's some cultural problem where people are finding it harder to you know, to, to pair off in the first place, right? And this is what you see in the dating market, that you have people are, you know, having less sex before marriage, which conservatives, you know, could be excited about, except then they're getting married less and, um, and having fewer kids and living longer and longer periods of their lives in singlehood. And this, it's not clear, you know, it's not clear that this is just sort of people's free choices. People still express strong desires to get married and have more kids than people are actually having. But there's some sort of social breakdown that, again, has an economic component. Probably it's connected to male wages and expectations for gender roles. But there's, there's some kind of breakdown happening before you get to the point where people are making the decision whether or not to have that kid. So following on from that, uh, the next question is, what are your thoughts on universal basic income? I mean, I think a universal basic income in a decadent society probably just sort of deepens decadence. And um, that, that, you know, that if you have a society where people are already being sort of conditioned to lose themselves in virtual amusements and are sort of struggling to do things like get married and have kids, then Creating, creating an income that isn't tied to any kind of real world activity, you know, it, it will improve some people's lives, absolutely. Um, but it's likely to sort of lock in that sense of stalemate and futility. Now, maybe I'm underestimating human beings, right? I mean, there's, there's certainly an argument that, you know, if you just, if you give people more money and free them from some of the dead end jobs they're working at, that they will you know, become more creative and do more creative things. And out of that will come, you know, new businesses, new works of art, you know, marriage, kids, the, the whole bit. Um, but I guess I have a more, I have a more cynical <laughs> view of human nature. And I think that, I think that if you drop the UBI, I mean, th there's a fair amount of evidence that UBIs work pretty well in developing societies, that if you drop a UBI into a society that is sort of growing and dynamic and aspirational, that um, and where, but where there's tons of grinding poverty, that it just lifts people out of poverty and gives them more opportunities. But my suspicion is that if you drop it into a society that's wealthy, already has a social safety net and has a problem with people sort of being stuck in place, then it doesn't actually help. Like if you look at, right, if, if you look at, you know, rural America right now, right, like you have you know, the, the, problem, the problems in rural America are problems of sort of drugs and despair. And it, those are problems that could be solved by, you know, religious revival, um, by forces that sort of encourage people to move out of those communities, um, by jobs returning to those communities. I'm more skeptical that they would be solved by giving everyone in those communities a little more money every month for free. Mm -hmm. 
Um, our final question is a long one. Um, would you say it's true and evident through history that decadence is simply a timeless, placeless, anthropocentric intent that results in unfruitful ends? There's a little bit more to the question here. For a Catholic, could it be that the turnover of technology, fashion, and power regimes and our current moment matter less than recognizing the tyranny of mortal desire that drives decadent choices and is resolved by the gospel? I mean, yes, right? So obviously the actual solution to decadence <laughs> is for everyone to um, become a saint and lead a holy life and, you know, for more people to join monasteries and sit on pillars and go into the desert to have encounters with God. Um, and I'm, be, I'm being perfectly serious here, right? I, I am a Christian and I actually, I actually think that and that those encounters are fundamentally more important to human beings and they're not just mortal but eternal destinies than are trying to be, you know, innovative in building, you know, in building a self-driving car. However, but at the same time, I think that there is actually a connection between um, sort of the, the kind of spiritual ambition that drives people to imitate Jesus Christ and, you know, sell their possessions and give things to the poor and more worldly forms of ambition. And this is, you know, maybe one of the more unusual ideas in the book, so it's a good place to end. But I think actually that, that Christianity, and not just Christianity, other religions as well, benefit from existing, sort of coexisting with more and that if you are a religious person living in a society where your neighbors are ambitious in worldly terms, you are more likely to become, um, you know, sort of ambitious in your, in your quest to become a holy, a holy saint of God. And that in fact, sort of periods of religious revival often emerge out of the challenges created by secular ambition and, and dynamism, right? And so um, Peter Thiel, Michelle's favorite billionaire, uh, who I, that's, I'm being sarcastic, who, but I, I quote him a few times in the book because he's a critic of decadence. He's also some sort of, you know, very eccentric religious believer. Um, and he has this line that the Bible begins in the garden, but ends in a city. Um, and I, I actually, I think about that line a lot as, as a religious person, right? That sort of, you're not just, you know, as a religious person, you're not just trying to recover Eden because you can't recover Eden. You can't just go back to sort of the pastoral. There's something, there's something beyond that you're supposed to, you know, whether you're building the kingdom of God here on earth or aspiring to the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem, there's some sort of ambition for the future that is that connects the secular and the sacred in a healthier society than the one I think we have right now. So how's that for a wild ending? That's great. Wonderful. Thanks to you both. Thanks, Michelle. Thank oh, you. Thank Ross. you, Michelle. No problem. Thank you. Really fascinating. Really great. Um, thanks to our audience. Thanks for all of the great questions. Um, I encourage you all to buy this book. Um, all of our uh, community events this summer are free and open to the public. And so if you are in a position to donate, please click on the link in the chat. Um, and I also hope you'll, that you'll join us for our upcoming events. Um, tomorrow, we're featuring Dr. David Agus as part of our Murdoch Mind, Body, Spirit series. We have a lot of great events coming up this summer. So I hope you'll join us and um, until then. Thanks for, for um, everything.